Kreutzel, welcome. My name's Luke Clements. I'm the Cerebra Professor of Law and Social Justice at the School of Law at Leeds. And this talk that I'm about to give concerns the rights of carers to support from social services authorities under the Social Services and Wellbeing Wales Act 2014. The talk is divided into four separate sections. The first section, part one, is an overview of the legislation. And in that, I'll be looking at the rights of disabled people in, in, in particular. That may seem strange, but in reality, if disabled people get the support that they are entitled to under the Social Services and Wellbeing Act, then many of the commonly occurring problems that carers have in a way recede. We'll be looking, however, at how the assessment of the disabled person dovetails into, or feeds into the assessment of the carer. Part two of the talk will then focus on the rights of carers, the rights of carers to an assessment, what a, a good assessment looks like, what support services one could expect out of that assessment, and the way that that should be put into practice. Part three focuses on two specific caring roles, one by parents who have disabled children, parent carers, and the other of young people who are carrying out caring roles either for a sibling, a disabled sibling, or for a disabled parent, young carers. And the fourth part looks at commonly occurring problems. And in particular, it's going to look at problems uh, that are COVID related, related that have occurred during the current emergency, but also situations where there's conflict between a disabled person and a carer and how one could expect that to be resolved. The very final slide um, of this set of lectures concerns further resources. In this lecture, I'll be talking about regulations and codes and other documents like that. And these, um, the, the final slide explains how these can be accessed. Definitions and principles are important. They underpin the legislation. So what we're particularly interested in is the rights of disabled people and carers. And so it's important that we know how those are defined or how those entities are, are referred to. Previous legislation used to talk about handicapped people, crippled people, when it was talking about the needs of disabled people. The uh, 2014 Act doesn't fall into that trap. And it doesn't, in fact, uh, define people as disabled people, elderly people, or ill people. It just refers to them as people who may need care and support. But in the regulations, it goes on to explain that that need for care and support must arise out of or a, a physical or mental illness, ill health, age, disability, dependence on alcohol or drugs. And a carer uh, used to be defined as somebody who provided unpaid regular and substantial care. But in the 2014 Act, it's simply somebody who provides that care, care unpaid for, uh, but it doesn't have to be regular and substantial. But it must be uh, for a disabled child or a disabled adult. The underpinning principle in the 2014 Act is the duty on social services authorities to promote well-being. And in one sense, well-being is a bit of a fuzzy idea. Uh, one might have hoped that there were more specific uh, targeted uh, principles like the duty to promote independence or the duty to promote dignity uh, or choice. But well-being does encompass all of those ideas. Section two of the Act gives a long list of things that are 
included within the idea of well-being. So well-being includes your physical and mental health and emotional well-being, that you're protected from abuse and neglect, that you have the opportunity to undertake education, training, recreation, and so on. In that list, I think when we're talking about carers uh, of particular relevance, uh, but also for disabled people are the final two. The right to have control over your day-to-day -day life, but also that you have a right to, to be involved in work. Very significant numbers of carers have to give up employment because they have a caring role or go part-time or lose the right to promotion. Work is not just important financially, although of course it is, it's also important emotionally and socially. And so the Act places full square obligations on public bodies to take action to ensure that carers and disabled people don't lose out on their opportunity of being employed simply because of their disability or their caring role. And then the Act goes on to give further indications of the principles that must apply when promoting well-being. And again, it's a long list and it uncovers really many or all the aspects uh, that one would expect from a principle relating to disability and caring. But I think the last one is the one that perhaps we should all bear in mind at all times. And that is that there is a presumption that individuals are best placed to judge their well-being. Individuals are disabled person, individual or carer. So the default position is that they are the, the people that know best about what the support they need is and what the arrangements to meet that support should look like. As I've said, I think that the carer's assessment and the disabled person's assessment should feed into each other, should complement each other. So uh, if you have a carer and the carer is exhausted, they are in desperate need of a break uh, in order to recharge their batteries, in order to, to, to have some space, then the assessment would record on the carer's plan, their assessed need, would be they need a break. The disabled person would then be assessed for the additional support needs that they need so that the carer can have a break, so that the carer might need a substitute person to sit with them, uh, somebody who would be there at night for a night sitting service, somebody who could transport them to an activity so that the, care, the disabled person would get the same amount of support, but they would get it from somebody else rather than the carer. The carer would be replaced. And that additional support, and it's an important point, will be a need for the disabled person and it will be recorded on the disabled person's care plan. The carer's care plan will say the carer needs a break, the disabled person's care plan will say the disabled person needs these support services so that the carer can have a break. The Act places a duty on social services authorities to assess the needs of disabled adults, to assess the needs of disabled children, and also to assess the needs of carers. None of these uh, three groups need to ask for an assessment. As soon as the local authority is aware that they have these needs, then the local authority is under a duty to assess. And the financial position of these individuals is irrelevant. They could be wealthy or paupers and their needs could be great or small. Adults can refuse an assessment. Adult disabled people can refuse an assessment if they have the mental capacity, sufficient mental capacity to make an informed refusal and they're not at risk of neglect or abuse. They're not 
subject to safeguarding. And that's a subject we'll look at in the final talk. That's a situation where disabled adults are refusing services that the carer really needs them to accept, like a sitting service. There you have the conflict between disabled people and the people who care for them. And many of the principles about the assessment of disabled people and carers are laid out in uh, guidance, codes of practice uh, that accompany the legislation. And as I say, the last uh, slide on the last of these talks has a list of resources where these can be accessed. They're all available on the internet. So it's part three of a code of practice that gives the wicked detail about the process of assessments. The code, for example, says that an assessment, that the purpose of an assessment is to work with an individual care and family to understand their needs capacity, resources, and the outcomes that they need to achieve, and then to identify how best these can be achieved, uh, how they can be supported to achieve them. The core of this is a conversation about promoting independence and development by maximizing pe people's control over their day-to-day -day lives. Promoting independence is, uh, might appear to be a fairly um, straightforward concept, but it's not always. We, we have lived through a period where many governments talk about independence as being a sort of almost reifying, deifying the idea of independence, uh, people being independent, people being autonomous, people being self-sufficient. And we've also lived through a period where many disabled people's organizations talk about independence. What we have to realize is that these are two different discourses. When a disabled people are talking about independence, they're not talking about independence in the self-sufficiency way. Uh, they're talking about independence in terms of the state providing good quality supports so that the individual can then lead an independent life. Giving the, in the, the disabled person a set of, uh, of personal assistance, advocates, equipment, and so on, so that the disabled person can then have full access to the range of social activities, and personal activities and opportunities that people who don't live with disability have without needing support. It's not about taking away services and making people independent in the terms of self-sufficient, being self-sufficient. It's about giving people good quality supports. And what is important, and it's in the code of practice issued by the Welsh government, is that the Welsh government believes that independent has the meaning of providing good quality supports and not about self-sufficiency. Now, in order to be eligible for supports, the legislation in Wales provides regulations uh, on eligibility and these are really complex and technical, and I think in a number of respects, they're almost incomprehensible. But I don't think for the purposes of this talk, or in fact, in practice in 99% of situations, they are relevant. There's going to be a separate talk that I give concerning the wicked detail of eligibility criteria, but for the purposes of um, everyday life and this talk, I think that they can be distilled into some fairly simple, straightforward concepts. A carer or a disabled person, in order to be held legally eligible uh, to support, have to jump three hurdles effectively. The first one is that their need for support has got to arise out of them having an impairment, a disabled person, or a caring role. Because of my caring role, I 
uh, need support. Normally that's not going to be a very difficult hurdle for either a disabled person or a carer to cross. The second thing that needs to be established, the second hurdle that needs to be crossed is that because of their caring role or their disability, the carer or the disabled person can't do something that is important, a key activity. And we're going to see in a minute a list of key activities that the legislation states that disabled people and carers must be able to carry out. And then the third hurdle is that because of they because they can't do something, they need the local authority to support them. And in order for that to be established, it's got to be shown that there isn't anybody else that is willing and able to do it, a carer or some community activity that's readily available to them. If there is nobody else willing or able or available to provide that support, then a duty crystallizes on the local authority to provide that support. In many respects, the best way to understand the assessment process is to think of it as a question and answer. The question is, what if? And that's what the assessor needs to answer. What if this person, this carer or disabled person, doesn't get help from the local authority? What will happen? And the more severe the consequences, the more difficult it will be for the local authority to refuse to provide support. The more cogent will have to be the reasons the local authority advance to say no. And when we come to ask the what if question, what will be the impact on the person? We're talking about the impact on their well being, their physical health, their mental health, their social and emotional well being, as well as their ability to uh, engage in employment, education, training, leisure, and other social activities. So the more evidence that the disabled person and the carer can advance as to the consequences of the local authority failing to provide support, the more difficult it will be for the local authority to say no. So to summarize what we have just said, what we have to establish is that because of the caring role or the disabled person's uh, situation, they can't do key tasks themselves. That there's nobody else available, willing, and able to help them. And when we say that a person can't do something, we ignore the fact that they could do it, but it would cause them pain, anxiety, or distress, or that they could do it, but it would endanger their or other people's health or safety, or they could do it, but it would take significantly longer than normally expected. So they could dress themselves, but it would take them half an hour, three quarters of an hour. And when we come to look at these key tasks, what is it they can't do? Then really, I think they're just fairly predictable activities of daily living. So they would include not being able to eat or keep clean or get dressed or prepare meals or keep the home clean or move around safely or not being able to stay in work or return to work or undergo education, training or leisure activities. Or being unable to maintain personal relationships or involvement in community activities. Or they may have uh, a child. So if it was a disabled person that we're assessing, they would have all of those needs. But if they had a child, uh, they would also have the responsibilities of a parent caring for a child, and those would be a task that they may need support with. And the same for a, a carer. A carer may be caring for a disabled parent or, or friend, but the carer themselves may have a child, and therefore that's an additional task that needs to be considered.
And just as I think the key question we have to ask about an assessment is what if, what will happen if the disabled person or the carer isn't provided with support? What adverse consequences? So too, once we've decided that the disabled person or the carer is eligible for support, then the local authority must, in care planning terms, provide a very clear statement of how that need is going to be met how it's going to be met, who's going to meet it, what is going to be done and when is going to be done. And that is, a, 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 it's, it's essential effectively in care planning terms that we have that level of detail. Who is going to come along? What are their skills? What are they going to do? What is the point of this caring role, when is it going to be done, Mondays, Tuesdays, what time, what happens if things go wrong. Uh, it's a specification uh, which binds effectively the local authority. We decided you need this and this is exactly what we're going to do to meet that need. So it's a very detailed plan of the obligations. And I often liken that to a builder's plan. I mean, you could ask a builder if you've got renovation work to just go in and sort it out. But most of us would actually want to have a drawing or some sort of technical document spelling out precisely what is going to be done so that if things go wrong, as often they do, you can point to the specification to the plan and say, look, this was agreed. You agreed to do this and it's not been done according to that plan. That's exactly what the purpose of a care plan is. And for that reason, it's going to be very important to have a copy of it, a copy of the assessment and a copy of the care plan. And the legislation and the codes provide for people being given those copies. And it is crucial uh, to go through that and, uh, and to take up with the local authority any errors, any inconsistence, any facts that are wrong or any level of detail that is missing. Uh, for instance, it might be a, a, an assessment concerning somebody who's got autism or some other difficulties that they really need care assistance with particular skills, that they don't need a, a, a turnover. That, that, that some people sometimes don't like having to see a different care assistant every day. So the care plan might say that routine, predictability, uh, absence of change are assessed needs as well. And if there are problems, then it needs to be taken up with a local authority in writing. 